Recorded at Get a Grip Studios in Toronto, Canada. A Get a Grip management production and in association with the Get a Grip on Lighting podcast. Financially supported by the good folks at the National Association of Innovative Lighting Distributors, this is Restoring Darkness podcast. This episode of Restoring Darkness is brought to you by Evluma. If you're serious about contributing to the reduction of light pollution, go to evluma.com, hover over products, and click on Dark Sky Friendly Lighting. Both the OmniMax and AreaMax lights are International Dark Sky Association certified. The warmer color temperatures of the OmniMax reduce the more easily scattered blue wavelengths, which contribute to glare and sky glow. With AreaMax lights, you get full cutoff, which also means no uplight and a significantly reduced contribution to sky glow. And all of Avluma's outdoor lighting product lines come with dimmable drivers for even more control. If your customer is looking for dark sky friendly fixtures with energy savings while still meeting the demands of decorative lighting, look no further than Evluma. Evluma, illuminating the pursuit of dark skies. Welcome back, folks, to the Restoring Darkness podcast. On today's show, I'm quite pleased to be joined by Johan Eklauf, uh, PhD. Dr. Eklauf is a Swedish bat scientist and writer most known for his work on microbat vision and more recently light pollution. Johan has studied bats for almost 25 years and now has his own consultancy company, hired by authorities, wind companies, municipalities, city planners, and environmental organizations as an expert on bats, night ecology, nature, and and nature-friendly lighting. He was born in 1973 he got into music and fantasy games and all this kind of stuff in his youth. So, But eventually that led to a fascination with nature and evolution and paleontology. It led to a master, led to a master of science in biology and earth science, studying trilobite, trilo, uh, trilobites. However, paleontology was not an option at his university, and he switched to zoology. And now he's focused on bats. He's the Batman, folks. Um, he stayed at the university a while. And uh, now he's writing books. And uh, he has a children's book, uh, some on folklore and poetry. But today we're going to talk about his latest book. It's a Darkness Manifesto. And if you're listening to this show, you know why I'm interested in knowing about that. It's published in Sweden in 2020 and in Britain in 2022. And and now it's going to be published in Canada, United States. It's been translated into a lot of languages, French, German, Italian, Dutch, and Japanese. So, I'm welcome. I'm very pleased to be joined by the Batman, Dr. Outclough. Welcome to the Restoring Darkness podcast. Thank you, and thanks for having me. Why is it that to, that of all the creatures, um, my my podcast here, our podcast here, has the wolf howling at the moon as its symbol, but it seems to be that the number one symbol of darkness restoration or of night. Rest, or night preservation or whatever you want to call this movement that seems to be happening is the humble bat why the bat uh, well they are very nocturnal i mean there are <laughs> 1400 species of bats uh, in the world and not a single of those species had turned to the day they, they're all nocturnal mm. and so, so bat. i think so- it's just a good symbol um, and so your interest in them is very scientific, though. It is it is symbolic, obviously, for the movement, but your interest in it is scientific. What have you learned from bats, and, and why is preserving their habitat important for all living things in the, in, 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 on the Earth? Um, I've learned a lot from studying bats. Um, but one thing I've learned is that we still know very little. It's very... Mm-hmm. I think we will never really understand how they perceive the world uh, using echolocation. It's it's incredible how they can you know, manage just by listening to echoes of sounds to navigate through a dark a dark area. I mean that is something that's that's very fascinating. Although I, I used to study vision, uh, debunking the myth of that. That bats are being blind; they they still use their vision, but but echolocation is still something that 
they're not they're not alone in the animal kingdom uh, there i mean we have the dolphins and a few others but they are the masters they can really detect minuscule things like spider webs and everything just just using sounds and that's incredible and so in a sense they're they're navigating the world by sensing vibrations is that the right way to put it um auditory they, vibration oh yeah yeah i mean they, they do just like we do we, they scream if, if we stand in a tunnel or in a valley or something and we we shout we get an echo mm -hmm. but we can hear we can hear a mountain and they mm -hmm. can hear a mosquito hmm that's so interesting. And they're there and they're hearing. So it is hearing that you're using. They're using uh, like the same kind of systems that humans use. It's a hearing yeah. system. Yeah. Hmm. So they shout and they stop and they listen. So. Uh, so they use both their mouth. Well, some some bats can scream using their nose, actually, but often they use just their mouth and then they stop for a tenth of a second and listen for the echo. And this is ultrasonic, so it's a it's ultrasonic to humans, so we can't yep. hear these screams. No, we can't hear. Uh, we can hear some of the uh, the social calls when the mothers are talking to their pups, or they have some mating calls and stuff like that. Hmm. And we're just welcoming um, John Bullock to the show. John, say hello to uh, Doctor Johan Eklauf. <laughs> Johan, how are you? Good to see you. Yes, just fine. I, I'm also, just going to move my, my own uh, face from your face. So now I can see you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, also known as the Batman. Okay, John. Um, yeah, I know that. I've seen that. <laughs> yes. So we're just talking a little bit about bats. So this all the, the, the ultrasonic range for bats, is it much greater than the hearing range that humans have like so if you're looking at the sound range that bats use or able to use as for navigation purposes or what have you how much of of that can humans hear and how much more is it that we cannot sense or hear it's a little bit different for different species but they do have uh, often they have a wider range so there are sounds that we can hear and they also go up to like uh, 100 or even 200 kilohertz mm -hmm. and we stop at 20 that that's our limit and so do these sounds do, do, do they still affect this even though we can't hear them or like is there um another way in which that these sounds if i've often heard with in and just to relate it to lighting so there's a type of occupancy sensor that is ultrasonic Okay, so it's it's using like a the way a bat would use to turn off and on lights in a space by sensing motion using an ultrasonic frequency. Um, and people have told me, and I'm not sure if this is true, but that even though you can't hear it, that screaming sound of that sensor does affect you. Is that is that true in your experience or not? Uh, if the sound is very close to our range, if it's just above 20 or around 20, we can sort of sense it without really hearing it mm. and some people are more sensitive mm -hmm. uh, hearing a little bit better than others uh, but i i realized when i'm when i'm out listening for bats i have these ultrasonic devices so i can hear the bats and then i can also hear a lot of other stuff like lamps for example or uh, chargers for tesla cars or wow there's, there's a lot of things having ultrasound that you you don't really realize that and is that is there a sound because i've often said that you know when we started this it could be restoring silence could be the name of the show that you know silence and darkness are kind of you know the the human interference with sound and light are very similar to one another um do we have a sound pollution problem along with a light pollution problem yes we have um uh, if you're just speaking of bats, I mean, you can see that bats are uh, not hunting close to motorways, for example. They, they stay mm. away. Uh, if you're talking about uh, the animal life in the sea, you have all these problems with whales mm. uh, getting you know, very disorientated just because there are so many boats making all these sounds, all these noise. So we do have sound pollution. 
and this very noisy species don't you yeah (laughs) yeah yeah, i mean yeah the bats are extremely noisy so (laughs) so so we just uh, you know uh, we just interviewed another another uh, uh, academic um dr vivian shrimplin in the uk and 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 so she was speaking to a sort of spiritual disorientation that that is afflicting humans now because they can't see the stars. And she was illustrating to us how much of our, you know, our mythology and religious imagery is related to seeing stars. Like it's massive, actually, how how connected human mythology, legend and religion is to the cosmos. Um do you, is this sound disorientation, do you, your darkness manifesto, and I'm just going to move into that and then turn it over to, to, to John Bullock to, to ask you some questions, but um, is this disorientation, uh, whether it's with the sound and the, uh, the interference for animals in, in the sea or bats, this, this chaos of, of modern life, is, is this di- disorientation, is that affecting us spiritually? And before we get into your book, maybe that's a good segue to the Darkness Manifesto. Is that what's causing a lot of our problems? Could be. Um, I, I, my parents-in-law, has, uh, they have a summer house far north in Sweden, in, you know, way out in the forest. And when I was there the first time, I, I heard silence for the first time. Hmm. It was so silent. I mean, you mm. could almost hear your own heartbeats, and you don't experience that anywhere in the world. And I had this colleague coming up from Netherlands, and we asked him, "Well, do you want to go in this particular place? What do you, what do you want to see?" "I want a silent place," he said. Mm. Didn't care where to go or anything out in the forest somewhere, but he wanted to listen to silence. So I think that could be something we're missing, and we, and if it's spiritual or just relaxing in some sure. way, but yes. and it's the same with light. I mean, darkness is like silence for the eyes, so to speak. Hmm. Hmm. I think it's um, it's an it's it's an interesting connection to make. I think it's a very important connection to make that that darkness and silence do need to be seen to be working together because let's face it you can go and stand underneath a, 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 a huge highway and close your eyes put a put a black bag over your head it wouldn't be very comfortable it would be dark uh-huh. but it would be incredibly noisy and it's 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 interesting johan in, in the things that, that that you write where you're saying that that you are I, I sense you're not only seeking darkness you are also seeking that silence as well the two things go together um yeah and, i think they're connected yeah yeah and it's but is it the problem i i feel we have just be interested to see wh- where we think we can take this that we have been evolving this for 250 years i usually blame it on james watt and the invention of the steam engine <laughs> all our all our ills go come down to that guy playing with a <laughs> kettle in his mother's kitchen um <laughs> But before that, you know, if you wanted power, you had to go and find a, a fast running stream or the, the top of a hill. It was the only place that you could actually get the, the ability to turn things around in order that you the, the, in order that you could mill your corn. And the world was made up of natural sounds, bird sounds, you know, animals rustling through the undergrowth. And we've lost all of that. We've given all of that away, um, but we've done it in a continuum. We've done it. You know, we, we've done it year on year on year on year, and here we are now in in a kind of an existential crisis. And friends of yours are saying, "Take me somewhere quiet, please. <laughs> yep. Take me somewhere quiet." Now, yeah, here am I. Here am I as a practicing lighting designer. So, so I, I'm in a sense, I'm one of the bad guys because I'm I'm putting light into places that maybe I shouldn't be. And we're having conversations which are worthy, which is why we're doing this today. But Johan, in the conversations you're having, can you see any way through this? Can mm. you see any particular direction where you think where, where, where we might go? Actually, that is something that people could get get into and get behind. That we can try and reduce some of this this 
noise this and you know light noise audible noise the whole thing the whole mm. mess of human the whole mess of human civilization hmm. So it's just yeah, a small well, question, are, uh, Johan. <laughs> oh, yeah, really. Um, <laughs> I mean, there are some movements around the world which is pointing in one direction. We have, uh, I'd like to say that we have, except for silence and darkness, there's a third thing that we're missing. Uh, that's slowness. Mm. Uh, we, yes. we do things very, everything should be so fast. We, we have to do, if we're done making this, we, we need to make that. And then we, you know, perhaps that started with uh, James Watt as well. I don't know. Uh, Probably. <laughs> but, yeah. So, but people are starting to react. Uh, we have, for example, this called slow TV. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a quite unexpectedly, but very popular show in Sweden just filming mooses walking you know, when they start migrating in the spring so you can just sit there and watch for hours just watch empty forests and all of a sudden you see moose and then it disappears again and that's called just slow tv yeah and we've, then you we've have had some this, of that in, we've, yeah. we've had some of that yeah. in the uk yeah it, yeah. it, it, it's, it's it is fascinating stuff it really is um yeah. and yet at the same time uh, it's it's all. It, it, what are we trying to do? We, we, we're trying to not find a, an escape from the, the the speed of of life of life and the noise of life, but we'd like to be able to replace that noise and replace that speed with slowness being the way that we function. Mm. Yeah, you know, we have slow design, for example, and yeah. and. Clients hate it because it means that they usually have to spend more money on their designers <laughs> because their designers are taking twice as long to come up with a solution. And they go, no, I want it at the end of the week. And you go, no, you can't. No, hey, come on, guys, you know, give us a break. But that's really where we need to go. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I think, I mean, that goes hand in hand with other movements like finding quiet spots and uh, we have uh, natural reserves kind of trying to preserve uh, silence uh, and now we have dark dark parks and mm -hmm. sky reserves so all of that together is it's showing us that well we have found uh, something that we're missing and we need to go there but then we have all these other things pointing the other direction. It's going even faster. It's getting brighter and more traffic and more noise. So I'm not, I don't know if we can see a way out of this sort of, but I'm hopeful. I mean, light it, designers like you, I know are very interested in all these things. Yeah. Yeah. Are, are there, are there any initiatives in, in, in Sweden around, um, encouraging dark space? in the in the urban in the urban scenario actually actually in in within the cities you know we, we we've for a long time now we've been talking about having quiet spaces in offices so that you know chill out rooms where you can go and go and listen to a whale for half an hour you know they've a fantastic idea <laughs> um but you know there's, there's an awful lot of city out there that, that that's a little bit cruel and and, and a very hard place to be um and i just yeah. wonder in a place in like in sweden I, I, I haven't been to Sweden very, 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 very many times, but I do love it. And it's, it's like, it's the size of Britain with the population of London. You know, it's, it's great. There's no, no one lives in Sweden apart from nice people. Whereas we've got millions and millions of people and we, we're doing all of this. Um, but with that space that you've got, are you, are you able to, do you, do you think, is, is there any kind of move to bring the quietness of the forest into the heart of the city? Are you hearing any um, of that? I hear the ideas. The ideas are there, but they're not realizing those ideas. I mean, I, mm. in the parks in Stockholm, in Gothenburg, you have all the lightings, you have the traffic, you have, you know, so the parks are not the quiet space, not the dark space that you would like. Uh, but perhaps we're a bit spoiled having, I mean, it's, most people have 
quite not not a very long distance to to, to get to a forest or at least something looking like a forest <laughs> so we have we have remote areas still and we're allowed to go everywhere we have uh, what we call the alleman setten the rights to to do anything in the forest you can camp for a night you can pick berries and sure. so so that's so perhaps we don't need those parks as much. Okay. Not yeah. yet, anyway. The yeah. well, it's so I Go on then, just Michael. I'm just going to jump in here because I'm looking. I'm, I'm I love synonyms. I just I, if if I could go back to university, all I would study is synonyms because I think <laughs> I think a lot of synonyms are actually opposites, and a lot of opposites are actually synonyms. To, to one another like people the things that are considered opposites like admiration and 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 um envy are synonyms right those two things are synonyms to one another very similar emotional feelings and often but anyway long story short i'm writing down that slowness darkness silence these are synonyms to one another in a way they they mean the same thing in this realm that what we're talking about and then when you were talking about how there's you know the sound there's like a tumult a ruckus a racket a clamor commotion din cacophony of things lights and sounds that are just driving us crazy as a species and also herding bats and whales and everything else this cacophony of light and sound and, and intensity. We need to slow it down. What have you laid down in your manifesto, Dr. Eklaf? What have you laid down in this doctor, <laughs> darkness manifesto of yours? Um, I would say that, well, in the manifesto, I try to uh, get people to realize that, well, we need darkness. We actually like darkness. Uh, darkness is not scary and if we just try to put out the lights for a little while we will we will see new things we will hear new things smell new things just sit outside in the garden for a while a dark evening and you see the sunset and see the world come to life in a different way that sort of things i'm putting in this book just to get people to appreciate the darkness when you say manifesto, so manifesto, um, you know, we have the the one known one, the communist manifesto, right? Um, and so what we're referring to is a is a shorter written document, which is a call to action towards yeah. some kind of movement. I'm ending the book with, with that. Okay. So all right. So that's the last pages of the book is like a summary and a few bullet points. Uh, Try to experience darkness, learn about the darkness, uh, enjoy darkness, uh, spread the word, and stuff like that. Hmm. John, we've had um, we, we we've had conversations um, uh, over the months with, with with lighting designers and 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 lighting researchers, and one of the one of the conversations that that has stuck with me is the scale that we need to be working at in order to elicit change. Um, mm. that, actually, as, as a youngster, one of the things that really impressed me in terms of a government taking action and doing so was when Sweden s stopped driving on the left-hand side of the road and started to drive on the right-hand side of the road. And it happened like that. It happened overnight. Mm. I mean, what a fantastic entire country. As I say, not many people live there. You know, a few million people, you can probably do that. But the idea that, you, that the country can go, I'll tell you what, I'd, we'd like you all to go home, leave your cars in the garage, and then when you come out in the morning, remember <laughs> to drive on the other side <laughs> of the road. And Woo! you go, that's a whole country. And wow. I think, so, but what, we, what we're learning from the conversations we're having is that in order to take on something as radical as a darkness manifesto, it needs a champion. And that champion needs to be at the level of a community. So it's almost as if you might be in the middle of Stockholm, but there's one community in the middle of Stockholm who goes, right, we're going to do this. And we're going to turn our street lights off. And we're going to stop people coming in. And so you, you can't drive in here between then and then. And we're just going to encourage everybody not to stay home because it's dark, but deliberately to come out in, onto the streets because it's dark. And just and, and 
as you say, there is nothing to be scared of in the in the darkness. But we have to be we have to be able to give ourselves the permission to to do that. And and the idea that yeah, you know, wouldn't it be great if we could just say no? When you come out tomorrow, we're gonna not gonna have any street lights, and we're gonna we're gonna stop people driving their cars from ten o'clock at night till eight o'clock in the morning. But it it's difficult to imagine that happening. But in a community, you know, if we can just take a discreet group of people and say, and they say, we can take charge of this. I mean, sometimes you might say it's a little village because in small villages, that's exactly what it's like because mm-hmm. there is no lighting. Mm-hmm. But in an urban context, which I feel is what we, we it's important that we, we, we get into that, that we start looking at the concrete and steel and glass communities and bring those along with us. And I think the, you know, the, the idea that we can actually wave a manifesto at them is so important. I'm, I'm rattling on here, Johanna. I apologize for that. But uh, anyway, that's that's my feeling on it. Yeah, but, but that's right. You, you need a community, but you also need a government that can say that, well, uh, let's do this. Like the traffic. I mean, I, I remember my parents told me about this. They, they had their driving slices for just a couple of years when it happened. And, and they thought at the time that it was crazy. But afterwards, they said, well... <laughs> Luckily, we changed because the rest of the continental Europe drives actually on the right side. Oh, yeah. There's, there's only us left. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Hong Kong, I think, too, and maybe Australia. And so, Hong Kong, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, uh, so yeah. The, the manifesto, is the, 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 is the book, is it, does it start, is it broad ranging? Does it start with different areas or what kind of case are you laying down for this? And like, why should we do this? Um, what I try to do is, w- when I first thought of, well, I, I want to write a book about darkness and light pollution. Uh, at that time, nobody had ever heard about light pollution. That's, I mean, that's, yeah. I, I, I came up with the idea, it was like 2015 or something, and then it took a few years before I started. But So that was my first goal, so to put light pollution on the agenda, to mm. let people know about it. But I also realized that, I mean, I can't just write a book about turn off your lights, light is bad. And that would be just another thing, you know, like an environmentalist are saying to you, well, you can't do that, you can't do that. So I tried to turn it around a little bit. So I've written a lot about my own experience of darkness when working with bats and how nice it could be just sitting outside when it's a little bit dark and you can see like, glittering flowers from moonlight and you know, smell different scents you have never smelled before and sw- short stories like that to uh, trying to get the darkness out of the shadow so to speak <laughs> the, hey, so, the, wow yeah. <laughs> let's stop there Do- get the darkness out of the shadows yeah it might be time soul. to call it right there eh? just call it <laughs> <laughs> right, boom shut it down that's a dark, you get the dark it's a great line um you know the sales of the book um in swedish and in in then in, in other languages and in britain and that how's it gone has it been well received um it has your audience? Uh, yeah. uh, it's been out for two years in sweden and i received lots of great comments i i thought that i would hear from a lot of people, oh, why? Well, now we have to turn out the lights as well. Uh, but I've had a lot of, uh, I've been asked to, to hold seminars and talks everywhere for municipalities, for communities, for teachers, for pretty much everybody. Hmm. And I've light designers are one of the groups that have been the most interested of all. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I was actually having a talk uh, in a streetlight seminar in Stockholm a few months ago. And uh, when studying bats, when I was a PhD student studying bats, I, I did, well, in a few years, I think I will have a seminar in a streetlight seminar. Mm. I mean, I, it's it's the whole context. It's very new to me. But so the, so it's, here, here, it's so well received. Here, here's the reality. So the biggest enemy of the International Dark Sky Association was the lighting industry for the longest time. 
and and John, you can you can back me up on this that the oh, darkness yes. preservation people in the lighting industry were always at odds with each other. Like we're talking about not able to talk to one another. Like that's how bad the situation was. Like they couldn't have a conversation. Okay. And what I've been trying to, I'm in, I'm in the lighting industry. John's in the lighting industry. I sell light bulbs every day. As soon as I leave here, there's an order desk and people come in and they ask us about lighting and this kind of stuff. And I'll tell you, anybody in the lighting industry in 2023, that this issue is going to be the financially, the most profitable issue for the lighting industry. Okay, John, I don't talk about money. I'm European. I'm Canadian. I'm speaking mostly to Americans. I'm telling you about the cash, sucker. There's If we embrace this as an industry and really push forward, there's going to be lots of work to do for everyone, you know? Yeah, and I'm, I'm excited by that, John. It's like that. Oh, this, yeah. is, this is the number one revenue generator down the road for the lighting industry, okay? The second thing is, and I'm gonna on this. I want to throw this over to you, uh, uh, Johan. Is that um, I think climate change as an environmental issue is sclerotic. They have no idea what they're doing. The people that are really pushing the reduction in carbon emissions, like people are at the European Union level, are talking about this. They have no idea how they're going to accomplish their goals. Not a clue. Okay, and in a, in, in a place like Ontario, okay where we have 85% clean electricity. Think about that. Ontario, where I live, my province, 85% of our energy is generated from hydroelectricity or from nuclear reactors, okay? Almost 100%. We could probably get to zero emission electricity very quickly in Ontario. Impossible for Germany and Poland. Not even close, okay? They are decades away from where we are, okay? So, and in Ontario, we can't even stop increasing our carbon emissions like we can't even stop increasing okay and so i think the darkness restoration movement should absolutely be speaking to the carbon emissions people and the european union and uh ursula von der Leyen and you know whoever's prime minister of the uk today okay <laughs> whoever happens to be the prime minister today whatever Whatever wild man is in charge over there today with crazy hair, okay, and the president of the United States, and Turnberg, Greta Turnberg, whatever, the, you know, that child crazy girl that screams at everybody. Um, like, we should be saying to them, guys, we have the solution to a really serious environmental problem here. And guess what? If we solve it, it will reduce energy consumption massively across the world and that it will re eliminate light pollution which is an environmental issue how do we get the carbon emissions sclerotic crazy makers to actually look at this issue and say of all the things we're doing right now this will solve a ton of problems the it's not engineering it's not research it's not nothing has to be developed we know exactly what to do why don't we do this why don't we do this, Johan? Why don't we, why doesn't the European Union Brussels make this their number one priority right now? Do you want to take that, Johan? Well, <laughs> yeah, well they just you know they draw the card from the deck and say safety. Safety. Yeah, just say, safety, yeah, exactly. safety, safety, safety. Yeah. Yeah, we, we've we've got to see, we, we we are within I think uh, what are we talking about four of, no maybe uh, ten weeks I think uh, the final ten weeks of consultation on the latest um, energy savings in construction and it's coming down to how we should be writing our standards for lighting energy. Okay. Now we're saying um, the important thing here is consumption. The, 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 the important thing here is not whether it's an eight watt LED or a six watt LED or a 10 watt LED. It's about whether you're burning it for one hour, 10 hours or 24 hours. But oh no, 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 that's too complicated for this government. And of course, this government is not a European government. All they want is a number. Mm. So we're being driven to, uh, I'm sorry to give you numbers, Johan, 120 lumens per watt. Ah, oh, God, what a nightmare. Like what going, a up to going up to 140 lumens uh, per watt in 2025. How now, did the how is, did the British rule the world? Like seriously, like that's so stupid. Like how nobody could, else 
Nobody else turned up. That's so we, stupid. It, we, 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 were, we were just we were just there, and we had bigger guns than the natives, you know. And, well, and and so, but, 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 but we, yeah, so we, so basically, I mean, what we're trying to say to them, and this is this this actually says an awful lot about what what we're saying here. You play the safety card, and it means that someone has to turn the lights on. You turn the lights on, and the power stations have to turn, and they just have to keep going round and round to. Listen, listen this goes back to my sclerotic, does, John. This goes back yes, to yeah, exactly. the, I mean, the absolute scleroticism of carbon emissions. Like, yes, what are I'm you guys talking you. about? You're talking about carbon dioxide that you can't even stop from increasing, okay? That you're saying might harm people in 10 or 15 years. And then you're, we have a beautiful solution for you right over here. And Mr. Strawman argument shows up. Listen, you, the, the, we got to fight back harder, Dr. Eckloff. We have to fight back harder because you know what? That's a stupid argument from the European Union. Anyone that pulls the safety card is an idiot. And I'm sorry, but you are not you are not diving into this issue. You are acting like a straw man. You're saying, prove to me that darkness is safe. Well, hey, how about you prove to me that lighting everything up like a lighting Belgium up like a prison yard is safe? Okay? How about you, we turn that hypothesis around. I don't think that lighting up our cities like prison yards is safe, Dr. Aikloff. Can we turn this around on them and say, why don't you prove it to me? Because they have no proof. They have no proof. No, none. Sorry. No, but they have lots invested in. It's just, it's just a feeling. I mean, it's like yes. everything else. I mean, facts are no longer relevant. It's just feelings and thoughts and ideas and you know shouting the loudest mm -hmm. which i just did <laughs> which yeah. you did well, yeah. so, well, so, yeah. so i'm convinced yeah. <laughs> that, that's because you're wearing a very loud jacket today michael and it's just it's just taken over um one of the what was i going to say um yes uh, it it one of one of the one of the issues it, it it is about where we come from you know it's that we do not like change we do we do not handle change well we have got a situation where it, it well that wouldn't have happened if we'd had some light on it would it oh. well, well we don't know whether it would have happened if there'd been lights on it well we want more lights and you go well this is not actually going to be the answer this is not going to help us at all well they, uh, listen, i'm jumping in here 10 again years, so we have and go, they go see ahead. change in a way i mean yeah yeah i, I mean if if i walk the streets uh today that i walked when i was a kid mm -hmm. uh it will be much brighter. I remember places where it was so dark, uh, you were almost a little bit afraid to walk there, or or it was fun sometimes. But if you go there today, it's like, as you said, it's it's bright like a prison yard. It's mm -hmm. so if people are afraid of change, they should just look back ten years and see that we actually have changed quite a lot. But yeah. is it better? <sighs> I yeah, listen, uh, LEDs, uh, and I've said this, and I got I uh, on the Get a Grip on Lighting podcast, and I got shut down because I said light pollution has gone up by a magnitude, and I said this to a, a physicist, and he said to me, light pollution has not gone up by ten thousand times, right? I'm like, okay, fine, not ten thousand times, but like a hundred times is enough, actually, you know, it's gone up like crazy. And he was like, oh, okay, fine. As long as you're not being technical here. No, I'm not being technical with that. I'm trying to illustrate to people that light pollution has absolutely gone crazy. We're completely stuck in uh, Javon's paradox with this. The, the cheaper the LED light fixtures become and the lower the energy they consume, the more people blast light everywhere where they want and without, with full reckless abandon, including our municipalities. Johan, including our municipalities are doing this. And and yeah, there has to be a way out of we have to can we get Greta you're you're Swedish, right? Sweden's got what, <laughs> hundred and fifty people or something? Call Greta Turnberg up and say, Listen, lady, okay, enough with the climate change. Here's a solvable environmental issue. Can you please go scream at the adults about this issue for a bit? Maybe they'll listen to you. Can you do that for us? <laughs> I think Unfortunately, they're they are the wrong people listening to her. Mm. Um, today we have a right wing government. Mm -hmm. uh, the f one of the first thing they said when before the election said, "Well, we we will spend one billion Swedish crowns. That'll be I don't know uh, on lightings for safety." Uh -huh. 
we will we will fight crime. We will spend one billion on lightings. So, hmm. I mean, what can you say? But, but, yeah, well, ex exactly. At some point, the auditors will come in and they'll 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 check the figures and they'll check the crime figures and, and they'll say we haven't. Yeah, we've got we, in, in the UK we're locking up more people than we've ever locked up before, and mm -hmm. and we've got the brightest streets that that, that we've ever had. Mm -hmm. um, and there and clearly there, there's you know non scientifically there is no correlation mm -hmm. between the two. And and here we are, the sensible people who want the 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 kind of environment that we're talking about are we're being drowned out mm -hmm. in in the conversation. So we, you know, a friend of mine does uh, this Japanese thing of forest bathing. You know, the idea mm. that you go off into a forest mm. and you yeah. you hug a tree for a few hours. Well, maybe she should be doing that in the dark. You know, go and hug a tree in the dark to get more mm. people associated to, to 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 understand what it is that we're trying to do. I mean, even just going back to the lighting standards that were that are thirty years old would help. Mm. You know, let's let's go back to the light levels that we used to have. Um, but you know, I say we, without we, we, we Johan, we've got to find examples. We've got to find people who are prepared to take on the the the, the darkness manifesto, and say this is how it works here, mm. and and just be brave. And and, and when, when people say you are oh, you're going to be robbed, people are going to break into your houses and they're going to steal your cars and they, you know they're going to attack you. you oh no no no. Well, we'll see, shall we? And when that stuff doesn't happen, because criminals like the light as well, apparently, we'll see what happens next. I have a comment on that, John, but I'm going to wait for, for Johan to, to, to... I have a comment. I wrote it down, so I'll remember. Oh, okay. <laughs> Go ahead, Johan. Uh, yeah, yeah I, 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 was this, I, I was listening to a seminar for different uh, biologists, there were light designers, uh, People working in the municipalities with with lighting and engine, engineers, and and there was this one guy say, "I'm not waiting for any laws. I'm not waiting for the politicians to make decision. I'm in charge of the lighting in this city. I've started to just you know turn the lights down a little bit every year. Mm -hmm. Nobody ever notices. Nobody notices yeah. for sure. <laughs> yeah. Oh, if so you, he, he was just it, practical. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. If if you dim light." Slowly over, and when I mean slowly is like five minutes, okay? From, uh, you know, 100% down to 40% on a street lighting system, people in that environment wouldn't notice. And if you even tuned it from 50K to 2700K or 2200K over the course of five or 10 minutes, people would not even notice the difference. They would, they, their eyes would adjust. But you, Were I, you going to say something else there? I got, I got something here for you, okay? So I would go, go further. I would go further, John and Johan, both the same name. Isn't Johan John in Swedish? I think it's the same name, but John and Johan. Yes. Um, I would go <laughs> further. Yeah. I would go further. I, I, I think that LED glare actually causes accidents. Okay. And so what will happen is there'll be an accident on the road and the glare may have caused it, but nobody investigates that. Okay. It never gets investigated. It's not on the list of things that you would investigate. And so the answer to that question is actually more light. There, there wasn't enough light, actually. The, the, that was the problem. It wasn't the glare. We just need more glare. Um, but I would challenge you, and I would say that not only does electric light not, uh, or its absence or, or, or whatever, there are safety. Uh, we do need, we are not, we're none of us are advocating for no electric light at night. But I would argue that overly uniform, high brightness, 5,000 Kelvin LED streetlights actually cause a different kind of crime. And it's this kind of crime that we saw during the pandemic where people are out at night and they're rioting for whatever reason. And I think that 5,000 Kelvin high uniformity municipal lighting is, allows everybody to see each other. And this makes people very comfortable to be out in large groups and large spaces at night and creates types of crime or contributes to the kind of crime we see with crowds where protests seem to convert into these riots. And I think there's a, listen, there's a reason why, whatever your opinion on this is, there was a reason why you could see that guy, Scott Rittenhouse, so clearly. Like it's the middle of the night and this guy's out in the middle of the street Everyone can see him with a, a basically a military assault rifle, okay? And he's standing in the middle of the street. 
and you can see him from all directions, right? And he's walking around with a military assault rifle, okay? That's insanity. Like, how come you can see, like, if somebody had a military assault rifle and you couldn't see them, everyone would be gone. But because you can see him, you have this kind of weird situation that evolves where someone tries to sneak up behind him and take him out. And like when you you can watch this on camera, the only reason we can this, that incident even happened with that young man, whatever you feel about that incident, the only reason that type of incident happened is because that boulevard was lit up to with 5000 Kelvin high uniformity street lights from end to end and everybody could see each other. And I my, I'm postulating that electric high uniformity high brightness 5,000 Kelvin electric light at night actually causes a different kind of crime. Dr. Eckloff, can you comment on that for me? Do you believe that? Do you think that's correct? I have no idea, but I <laughs> wouldn't be surprised. Mm -hmm. okay, because John. we would do uh, things uh, during the night as we do, don't do normally. So mm -hmm. yeah. That's I what I'm saying. I, 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 I think we have a brutalist approach to our nighttime environment mm. um i, th I you know, you, you know we, we like to think that that you know our nighttime lighting is, is is so elegant and of course there are there are parts of the world parts of our city centers where yeah it looks fantastic mm -hmm. uh, a, a, a lighting designer said to me oh going back now whee, a long long time ago he said of course we shouldn't be called lighting designers we should be called visual designers because that's what we do Mm. Now, if you hold that thought, that actually explains an awful lot about why we might be putting light everywhere, because we want people to see what an elegant place so we can light our buildings. But of course, around that, just around the corner from th that elegant piece of, of building, there is the brutalist aspect of over bright, over white street lighting, which mm. might as well be prison yard lighting. Mm -hmm. So whatever's going on in anyone's head which leads them to the kind of violence that we're witnessing. It suggests that to me, it suggests that we're creating um, an, an urban environment which supports that kind of thinking, that we're not gentle people, mm. that, we're, you know, that, that we, we're not, we don't imagine so, you know, soft pools of light that might, you know, that, that might be down the middle of a boulevard, but they're basically everything's dark, but you've got enough light just to be able to see and you're not going to trip over the curb or whatever. But no, we, we have to hit it hard and hit it hard. So there's an attitudinal thing there. Um, what I was going to say, Michael, was I think mm -hmm. one of the problems that we've got with the climate situation is that no politician that I've heard has been brave in, brave enough to say in order for this in order for us to survive this we have got to change Every, everything seems to be working on the basis that don't worry you'll be okay you know you can fly away on holiday and you can drive a big car and you can turn your central heating up and you can wear a t-shirt while there's snow outside don't worry because we will solve this climate problem mm. another way well i would say Whereas, this take take your step back I would take a step back with those climate changers, okay? Which, they, they annoy me, because I don't like people that don't have solutions, okay? The climate change crowd is very annoying to me. And I'm saying to them, if the rest of us uh, out here that are advocating for this, we can make a huge dent. Darkness restoration can make a huge dent in energy consumption. We all know it, Dr. Eckler. Less energy. We're coming up on 50 minutes of recorded time here, if you can believe it, Johan. I've yeah, sorry I was late, guys. Forth. Yeah, that's yeah, okay. <laughs> I've gone back and forth on calling you Dr. Eckloff and Johan, but that's because I don't know why I'm doing that. But do you have any final <laughs> thoughts before, I, before we close out the show? Um, well, it, we've been talking a lot about safety and, you know, that, mm. that light doesn't solve crimes and stuff. But uh, there, if we don't only put on the lights for safety we, we we like to we have all these aesthetic lightings we we you know show off nice buildings with with floodlights so that's how i started the whole that's how i came to be involved in light pollution because i i was looking at uh, bat populations in churches that were floodlighted mm -hmm. and we wiped out half of the bat colonies in western sweden just by doing that hmm. 
so that was like a wake up call and uh that's one of the things i'd like to you know show in the book just look what we've done with just we wanted to see the church from miles away and now we don't have any bats, bats left i mean that's what happens but why do we need to see the church at three o'clock in the morning yeah like, well can't, that, that's, can't we just that, have it till like 10 o'clock <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's a very good question. Why? Nobody's there. I mean, I've been uh, at churchyard. It's a lot of a lot of times at night looking for bats, but I have never, ever seen another person. <laughs> no, like, the, like you talk about the, the aesthetic portion of it, and I agree. Like, even in, even in a city like Toronto or Montreal, which is much younger than European cities, we don't have the architecture that you guys have. But even so, some of the buildings look very, very pretty at night with, with these architectural lights. I, 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 I am not going to deny the, that, that there is beauty in this. But after 9.30, 10 o'clock, what do you got, drunks? You know what I mean? Like, you're, you're, you're lighting up the city for the drunks? The people that are out at one o'clock, like all this architectural lighting can be turned off. We can have it for a cup. We can have our cake and eat it too with this issue, folks. Which is why the Darkness Manifesto, written by Johann Eklauf, is so important in this movement. And you're going to go to Naka, Nat Baka. That's N-A-T-T-B-A-K-K-A dot com. Uh, there's uh, Instagram, Nat Baka, N-A-T-T-B-A-K-K-A underscore N-A-T-U-R. Uh, Twitter, copy bat, copy, C-O-P-Y underscore B-A-T. And then there's others. So we'll post them on the, the Restoring Darkness website for you to check out Dr. Johann Eklauf, um and his new book coming out in North America, Darkness Manifesto. Check it out. Is it available on Amazon, Johan? Uh, I would guess so, yeah. Probably. Mm -hmm. Everything is available there. Scotty, <laughs> grab the link for Amazon. We'll put a link to that on, on, on the website. And if you made it to the end, climate changers, you guys got to get your story straight because we're all straightened out over here with Darkness Restoration. We got a plan. We're ready to rock. We just need you to support us. That's right. And we're going to help you guys out a little bit with a lot of reduction in energy consumption. So check it out. Be a guest on this show. Come and talk to John and I. Promise you. We'll be really nice. RestoringDarkness.com. Thanks for listening, folks. Bye for now. Look no further for dark sky friendly products than Evluma. Since its first product launch, Evluma has carried one or more International Dark Sky Association certified models. If your customer cares about light pollution, suggest the Omnimax with shielding or the Ariamax with full cutoff to reduce uplight and glare. Evluma, illuminating the pursuit of darkness.